it's, it's going to be actually pretty interesting to talk about this now because now we have, I would say, an intuitive understanding of the Kubernetes network model because we've been using it for, for a few days now. So it's going to be interesting to revisit that and explain, okay, what's, uh, what's really happening behind the scenes? How does that really work? So on Kubernetes, the network is one big flat network. Uh, so this is pretty different from Docker. In Docker, uh, for the folks who were here last week, you might remember in Docker, uh, we have multiple networks that are isolated from each other. In Kubernetes, we have one network and that's it. All the pods, all the nodes, everything is in the same network and can communicate directly. There is no NAT, no uh, network address translation. There is no port mapping. Uh, we don't have like new protocols uh, coming in to uh, encapsulate or tunnel traffic or whatever. So it's relatively simple. And the only... Um, I don't know if I could call that a requirement, but the only implementation detail is that uh, you cannot decide the IP addresses of the pods. The IP addresses of the pods are set by the network layer. So that means I can't, I can't say, for instance, oh, I want that pod to have that IP address. No, you can't do that. You create a pod and the network layer is going to allocate an IP address for the pod, um, which, you know, that seems a reasonable requirement. Uh, and that has some really interesting consequences because uh, it gives a lot of freedom uh, to the network layer. The network layer can be implemented in many different ways. Um, and that's what, uh, that's what we're going to, uh, to explore now. So, Good news, we have lots of freedom uh, on to implement the network layer. Now the bad news uh, is that then it means that you have many implementations for that network layer. So for instance, let's say, you know, let's pretend for a minute um, that um, I'm setting up Kubernetes on a cluster, maybe a cluster of Raspberry Pi or a cluster of servers, a cluster of VMs, but you know, I'm, I'm doing my Kubernetes setup myself and so I'm, I'm following uh, the instructions and basically it tells me, okay, you need to set up your control plane. So, okay, set up the control plane. Uh, then you need to set up um, kubelet and TLS and this and that and whatever. So, okay, I do all that. And then it says, now you need to set up networking. So you need to pick a CNI plugin uh, corresponding to the, to the different mechanisms uh, for, for networking. I'm like, okay, which, which one should I pick? Well, good luck because we have to this day um, more than 20, I think almost 30 CNI plugins. Uh, so we have a pretty long list uh, here. Uh, all these are CNI plugins. And so for instance, we have um, the, you know, like the, some that are pretty well known and have been here for a while, like uh, Calico, uh, Weave, Cilium. Uh, then you have stuff like the Amazon ECS CNI, like specific to AWS EC2. Uh, you have uh, Juniper Contrail, so that's when you have Juniper uh, switches and, um, and, and routers. Uh, you also have one, I think, for Cisco. I don't know where it is. Uh, we have VMware NSX. Well, that's when you have VMware vSphere uh, clusters. Tearway, that one is for Alibaba. We have one for Azure. I think, yep, Azure CNI right there, um, et cetera, et cetera. So when we are in front of a list like that, we can ask ourselves, all right, which, which one should I pick? Which one is the best one? And as always, the answer is it depends. Um, it depends um, if, you, if you are running in a specific cloud, you might want to use the plugin like specific to that cloud. Like, so for instance, if you are, excuse me, if you, if you are on EC2, 
uh, you might you might want to pick the plugin like specific to EC2. Um, if you are on Azure, the plugin specific to Azure. But this is not a hard requirement. In fact, um, when you you know even if, for instance, if you if you go with a managed Kubernetes, you know, like for instance, if I go to AWS and I uh, provision an EKS cluster, so Kubernetes by AWS. Uh, it's going to be installed out of the box with the Amazon ECS CNI plugin, but um, you can replace that with another plugin. In fact, for a Kubernetes implementation to be compliant, you need to be able to change the, the, the network implementation. Uh, so what that means is that if a provider um, wants to you know to announce themselves as hey I'm I'm a Kubernetes provider and I can sell you Kubernetes clusters. If they want to be able to do that, they need to uh, let you change the CNI plugin if you want to. If you cannot change the CNI plugin, then it's not Kubernetes. It's that it's just sparkling container orchestration. <clears throat> so we have all these options and if I'm, let's say, on a stack of Raspberry Pis or a bunch of VMs or whatever, like uh, what can I choose? Well, again, it's going to depend on what's important for me. Do I want extreme performance? Uh, do I want uh, to have a really good observability? Uh, so to, to really see like the flows between my pods and my nodes, etc. Uh, is security important for me or do I want simplicity because I'm just setting up that little environment and I really don't want to, to spend like 10 hours just reviewing uh, uh, blog posts about CNI plugins. Um, so big, it depends here. Uh, so it's great because we have choice, it's not great because we have choice and sometimes it can be overwhelming. Um, now, in concrete terms, what about the clusters that we are using uh, here? So on the KubeADM clusters, uh, the ones that are kind of on-prem, I'm using Weave. Uh, Weave uh, has been around for a long time. Uh, it's pretty stable uh, and it just works. You know, it's a uh, um, zero configuration. You just have a YAML file, you kubectl apply that YAML file, and it works. So that's that's why I really like it for uh, for for these clusters, um, especially because uh, depending on the training, I'm going to use different environments. Um, I think I'm for the folks in the US and Canada. We are using uh, machines that are on uh, US West 2, so on, on Amazon. And for the folks in Europe, we are using machine on Linode, but sometimes I'm using machines on Scaleway or OVH or Hetzner or Azure or uh, some OpenStack clusters or etc. etc. So I wanted something that would be as universal as possible, that would just work everywhere with zero configuration. And in the five years since I've been delivering Kubernetes trainings, um, I almost never had to change anything in, in my Weave setup uh, things. I say almost because uh, recently there was, there was something that broke between Weave and ContainerD version. I don't remember the exact version, but let's say 1.5.2. So there was like one specific version like where we had like one incompatibility. Uh, so for a short while, uh, I had to force my, um, my container diversion in my deployment scripts. But in five years, that's pretty much the only time when I had to do something special to, uh, to set up my, the, the networking on these clusters. Um, now, on the other side, on the manage cluster side, what are we using? Well, we're using whatever the cloud provider is giving us. Uh, so in that case, we are on Linode, and I believe that out of the box, uh, they use Cilium um, um, or Calico. I don't remember. It doesn't really matter. It's an implementation detail. Most cloud providers are going to set something up for you, and if you want to change it, you can, but 
it's on you. Now, some providers give you more choice. So for instance, Scaleway, uh, that's a French provider. If I do Scaleway Kubernetes version list, ah, okay, sorry, I need to, I did not initialize this, so, okay. Um, I, and I don't know if I have my key on that machine. Well, if I had had my key on, on that machine, uh, I could have shown you that uh, on Scaleway, they give you uh, the choice between like four or five different versions of Kubernetes. And for each version of Kubernetes, there is a list of CNI plugins that you can use. And if I remember well, they give you the choice between Calico, Cilium, and Weave. Uh, so that's uh, that's pretty unique. I think it's uh, that might be the only provider I know that give you that gives you that that kind of choice. Um, so we are using Weave on, on these um, clusters because it just works out of the box. Um, but again, we could change that. We could replace that with something else. Now. The CNI is just the part responsible for the communication between the pods between and between the pods and the nodes. But we have multiple layers uh, in uh, Kubernetes networking. Uh, and this is what I call the Kubernetes networking lasagna dish because we have like these three layers. Uh, well, if you have lasagna, which is like blue, bright green, and red, uh, maybe don't eat it because I don't think that food is supposed to be that bright green and blue, but who knows. Uh, so on that diagram, it might seem a little bit confusing because everything is mixed together. So let's look at these layers one at a time. First, we have the pod to pod network or pod network. So that's the part managed by the CNI plugin and that's the part responsible for communication between pods and nodes. Um, I've put a circle with things connected to it, but keep in mind that this is not the physical implementation of that network. Uh, this is just the logical uh, implementation. It just means, yeah, this is connecting all these things together, but then it could be using uh, routing or bridging or encapsulation, tunneling, whatever you want. This is just an implementation detail. As long as you have something that gives you IP so level three communication between pods and nodes, you're good. Then we have a second layer, which is the pod to service network. And this is the component responsible for uh, cluster IPs and node ports. And on most clusters, this is going to be kube proxy, at least out of the box. But there again, if you're not happy with kube proxy, you can replace it with something else. Some folks use Cube Router, some folks use Cilium. Uh, there might be other options that I don't know about. Um, so that's, that's again, something that you can change if you need to. And then we have a third layer, uh, which is network policies. And I think I mentioned it the other day. Uh, yeah, yesterday when we were talking about namespaces, um, I was saying, oh, namespaces don't give us isolation, like network isolation. Uh, if we want network isolation, we need network policies. Um, and that's what I try to show on that diagram. I don't know, it's very clear, but you see that we have some links with a, um, like a forbidden sign and some links with a little check mark. So network policies indicate which flows are allowed and which flows are denied on the cluster. And once again, this is a layer that is independent from the others and that you can replace if you need to. Um, for instance, I, if, if I remember correctly, uh, on AWS, on, on Amazon EKS, uh, you don't have network policies out of the box, which honestly is quite embarrassing. Um, but that means that if you want network isolation on, on AWS, um, you need to add your network policy controller uh, to implement filtering uh, and firewalling between your pods. And then when you put everything together, again, that diagram might, might seem a little bit complicated because of all the uh, intersecting lines and arrows, etc., etc. 
But what's really interesting, and honestly, when I realized that, um, I, I thought, wow, the, the, the folks who designed this system were really smart. What I find really great is that you can replace each of these layers independently without touching the others. Um, and I think that's, uh, that, that's really a sign of a good design uh, because uh, while a cluster is running, if you want, you can change the pod to pod network. And I'm going to give you a, a small example of that situation. Mm. If you are on AWS uh, and you're using EKS, so Kubernetes by uh, AWS, um, by default, they're going to use their own uh, AWS uh, ENI plugin thing. Um, and it has some, limita some limitations. And there is a limitation on, on the number of pods per node, uh, which comes from a limitation on the number of IP addresses per node. Uh, and since each pod needs its own IP address, if you have a limit in the number of IP addresses per node, that translates to a limit in number of pods per node. Um, so depending on the size of the node, you have more or less IP addresses. And depending on what you do with your clusters, uh, that limit might be an issue. So you might need to replace that plugin. And you can do that while the cluster is running um, and, and, and it's not so complicated. You know, I, I, I had a, a pretty, I don't know if I should say interesting, but at least I hope it was entertaining meetup presentation that I was giving a, a couple of years ago, uh, where we would show, you know, like live demo, we have this cluster and while the cluster is running, we are changing the network on this cluster while we have pods and applications running. Um, so of, now to be clear, if you want to do that uh, quick and dirty, yeah, we can do it during a, a 20 minutes uh, meetup presentation. Now, if you want to do it really properly with zero impact on the apps running on the cluster, etc., etc., it's going to take a little bit more than 20 minutes, but it is possible. Some folks have done it and then made a... Uh, uh, much better presentations about it than I do. Um, and, and, and yeah, and the, everything else keeps running. You have the same uh, firewalling rules, you have the same load balancing layer. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of stuff you can do. Um, all right, 